So finally, our last and greatest award is the Gold Medal Award. So each year, members of the society, they're given the opportunity to nominate individuals they believe are worthy of the Gold Medal Award. It's the highest honour within the society. It's awarded for major research contributions to the field of molecular imaging within the scope of the society's purpose. And again, I'm pleased to announce that the committee selected Dr. Bernd Pitchler as the 2023 Gold Medal Award winner. Professor Dr. Bernd Pitchler is the director of the Werner Siemens Imaging Center and chair of the Department of Preclinical Imaging and Radiopharmacy, as well as the dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen in Germany. He earned his PhD in physics at the Department of Nuclear Medicine Technical University of Munich and the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich in 2002, and then subsequently worked at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Pickler was the instrumental in developing APD-based pet, pet detector technology that is the basis for subsequent developments towards integrated pet MRI technology. Bernd and his team developed a dedicated PET insert for a 7T small animal MRT for simultaneous PET MR imaging. His work focuses on interdisciplinary basic research in biomedicine with the use of state-of-the-art imaging technologies. This includes multimodality imaging in oncology, immunology, and neurology, as well as the development of new imaging technologies and innovative imaging processes. In recent years, he has published widely on the preclinical as well as clinical Im implementation of PET MR imaging. His CV lists more than 250 publications and book chapters. So, Bern is a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, and a member of the German Academy of Science and Engineering. He's the past president of the European Society of Molecular Imaging and was recently uh, given an honorary member of ESME. Uh, he has many, many awards. Um, one he recently received is the George von Hevesy Medal from the German Society of Nuclear Medicine in 2021. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bernd Pitchler, the gold medal winner for 2023. Thank you so much, Caroline and Julie. Someone forgot your iPhone. I hope you don't need it, and I hope it doesn't start. <laughs> dear colleagues, dear friend, I'm really honored, and uh, this is my society. I really like it, and I'm very honored to get uh, this award. However, it's not about me, it's really about a team, and uh, I will uh, give you some uh, impression during my talk. Uh, what I did over the last 25 years, how I came to the field of molecular imaging, it was really more or less accidentally, and why I still have so much fun doing what I do, and uh, most important, doing it with you in this really great society. So everything started really with a small poster on the auditorium of the Technical University of Munich of the Linde Auditorium, which holds about 1,200 people. And the poster said the glassy man, the glassy human. And there was a phone number from the Department of Nuclear Medicine, which was the department of Markus Schweiger at the Clinic of Rechtsaisa in Munich. And as a student, I just was interested. It was actually an invitation to a talk about what you can do with imaging. I didn't even go to this talk. I just called them, and they said, OK, stop by, just come. And that's what I did. And then I saw the nuclear medicine department. And at this day, when I visited them, the first PET scan in Munich uh, was under service, and it was open. And I was just fascinated, the detectors, the electronics radioactivity, biology, and medicine. So it looked like, for me, an ideal combination. 
And that's where I, everything started more than 25 years ago. And I went as a student and I stayed as PhD student and then as postdoc before I moved on. Together with the uh, uh, clinical rates, the ESA in Munich with the TUM, the Marco Schweiger department, we were really closing together with Dr. Eckhard Lorenz at the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich. And actually, this is really where the work, what I did, started and where, for us in Munich, PET MRI started. So Eckhart was actually uh, essential and he worked in high energy physics at the CERN. And actually, he built large telescopes, large, large telescopes for uh, astronomy. And uh, those telescopes were installed at the Roque de los Muchachos at La Palma. And you see one of those telescopes. So it has 17 meter diameter, and actually it has a height of approximately 25 meter. So what has this to do with medical imaging? Well, the problem was they had to detect Cherenko flight, which is blue light, really faint blue light, which comes from the sky, from, other, from the universe. And the problem is that if they know there will be an air shower, they have to move around this telescope within one minute, adjust all the mirrors you see over here, and then there's a detector for this really tiny light flashes over here. And the problem they had, the detector need to be small and light and need to be not temperature sensitive and so on. So therefore, they used over years photomultiplier tubes, and then they went step by step with the CERN in Geneva to avalanche photodiodes. And that's actually where our combination came, that we worked together on avalanche photodiodes. They did it for high energy astrophysics, and we used it in Munich at the clinical department of Markel Schweiger and Sibylle Ziegler for PET. And just for those of you who maybe have never seen a PET detector, it was in earlier year really a bulky system. So there were photomultiplier tubes, there were scintillation crystals, and we replaced those photomultiplier tubes by so-called avalanche photodiodes, mm -hmm. semiconductor photodiodes. And honestly, it was a long, it was, it, it was a stony journey. I still remember comments from colleagues from industry, they said, well, we never need APDs. We never need semiconductors. We have all our detectors of the photomultiplier tubes in our cabinet. Why should we go to semiconductors for medical imaging? I guess all of us know that the new PET scanners, they are now all of semiconductor-based detector systems. The new CT scanners, everything is towards semiconductor systems. And PET MRI would have never been possible without these detectors. There were only few groups. We in Munich, Roger Lecomte in Sherbrook, and Professor Yamamoto in Osaka, who worked at that time, 25 years ago, on those detectors for positron emission tomography. So why is it so important? Those uh, photomultiplier tubes, if you put them in a magnetic field, first of all, you cannot do any more MRI. And second, your performance from the PET detector, your so-called precision profile, where you identify single individual crystals, it collapses completely. So therefore, with the avalanche photodiodes, the precision profile stays. You can do it up to 9.4 Tesla. We tested it at that time. You can even go now higher. And actually, this was the first detector. We had 97 in a 9.4 Tesla magnetic field in Munich. And we could see that it works. I was really happy as a student at that time. And I submitted my first paper. It was to IEEE Transactions on Nuclear Science. They sent it right away back. It was rejected. I still have it at home. I never submitted it again. I still have it at home. And the only thing which got published was a conference record, which was for many, many years my most cited um, paper. So this means never give up uh, and really try if you convince. They said PET MRI will never work. You cannot operate a PET scanner in an MRI. You will not get PET images and you will not get MRI images. So again, I thank therefore Sybil Ziegler and Markus Schweiger who supported me at that time that I could this basic research on avalanche photodiodes and on the combination of PET MRI. 
In 2003, after my PhD, I moved on to UC Davis. And actually, this was my best thing I could do. I enjoyed it over there. I worked with Simon Sherry, and it was really a great time at UC Davis. So when I arrived at Davis, I had the first meeting with Simon, and Simon asked me, so what do you want to do in research? He hired me, and he said, well, you have the freedom. You can do what you like to do, what you are interested in. And I said, well, I would like to do two projects. One is to follow up my PET MRI work, to build a full ring scanner, directly integrated in an MRI. And the second thing I would like to do would be imaging of immune cells. And Simon said, well, that sounds really interesting. So you just need to get the money. And then he said, well, in four weeks is the NIH deadline, so go ahead and write two grant proposals. And I did this, an R03 and R21 at that time, and luckily I got it. So this was a little bit surprised that I had to raise my own money, but actually this was the best school I could ever have because I, I learned over there how to write grant applications. And actually this was one of uh, these, uh, excuse me, sorry. This was now the, the pet insert we built at that time, and you see it's a lot of duct tape, it's a lot of plastic, and there were these little tiny detectors integrated, and it had an axial field of view of two centimeters. Martin Judenhofer was my PhD student at that time, and then we moved the project when I moved to Tübingen in Germany, and actually we were very happy that we could do at the same time PET and MRI without influencing each other imaging modality. And these were one of the first images we could generate, and we were very happy to could publish this at that time at Nature Medicine as the first full ring, two centimeter axial field of view PET scanner, which is fully integrated with the anti-electronics in the MRI field. And at that time, it was a seven Tesla MRI scanner. Later on, Siemens took uh, this project on and they built a brain pet insert and we got over here the first one in Tübingen. You see this in a three Tesla standard clinical MRI install with the brain uh, coil and therefore we could also image first patient. So this was really exciting time. It was many, many hours at night in the labs. And actually in Davis, we had an hourly charge for the labs, and it was cheaper from midnight till six o'clock in the morning. So I booked always my time at, from midnight to six o'clock in the morning to exactly do those experiments. And the lab actually where we were, we were full with cockroaches. So when you switched on the light at midnight, they disappeared behind the lab furniture. But it was fun, and I really thank Simon for giving me the freedom to do the project I like. At the same time, as I said to you, I was also interested in doing immune imaging. And actually, there were two people very essential to do this at Davis. So it was one hardware detector-related, physics-related project, and one really biology-related project toward imaging the immune system. And we were focusing on Th1 cells, interferon gamma positive Th1 cells, and we labeled them with copper 64, and Julie was actually really very helpful. Uh, she learned me, she helped me, she supported me with all these studies. And I don't know how often she ordered and produced copper PTSM for me until she said, well, now you have to learn it on your own. So I learned how to do copper uh, PTSM. And I guess we made really wash you rich at that time because every week we ordered copper 64. And then we did this study, where do TH1 cells go? Where do they traffic? And there was another person which was very important, was Bob Cardiff. Uh, he's a, a physician and actually he's a pathologist and he helped us at the Center for Comparative Medicine at UC Davis to learn pathology, to learn immunology. And we still work together with Bob on the polyoma virus middle T mouse model, the breast uh, cancer mouse model with what he developed. Again, it was a great time with Simon and with Julie. We were in the morning uh, taking our coffee at the barn at UC Davis. And it was great working with her in the lab. And it was also great to travel with her. And this little picture, Julie, maybe you remember, this was in St. Louis. And I learned a lot for the private life, for my own life. So we were going up this arch with this elevator. Jason, I guess you know it from St. Louis. We were sitting there. There were four other people showing us. We didn't know them. 
And I was impressed by this engineering from this arch. I mean, this was great. There were screws like this big. And I asked Julie, just as fun, hey, Julie, do you want a screw? I thought a big screw, you know, a real screw. Julie was embarrassed. I said, what, are you crazy? Since that time, I know what it means if I say to an American or to an English-speaking person, do you want to have a screw? <laughs> I never did it again, <laughs> to be honest. Thank you, Julie, for teaching me those lessons. I never saw you so embarrassed, and uh, I don't know if anyone else did ever see you so embarrassed. So following this up, and this is still my hobby to work in immune imaging, and we have many people in the lab, you maybe heard several talks, I don't want to go into detail. We do, for example, now not only cell trafficking and cell homing and cell activation of different cells like Th1 or Th2 cells, we also use the CD69 radio-labeled antibody and see whether they are activated, those uh, immune cells. And like over here, after PD-1 uh, therapy, a PD-1 blockade, uh, we see that we have more activated Th1 cells by imaging uh, the tumor with CD69 than in the tumor which was not treated with PD1. And therefore, we could not only uh, really make an efficient uh, treatment response, but also see in the CD69 image that uh, those tumors which are uh, injected with uh, checkpoint inhibitors have uh, significant more enrichment of those uh, CD69 radio-labeled antibodies. Also, we do all the uh, ex vivo uh, investigation of uh, the tumor cells and try to really dissect the immune system of tumors and the microenvironment in vivo and ex vivo. Therefore, we develop now a complete pipeline of nanobodies, CD4, CIRP alpha, OX40, Vista, and CD69 nanobodies. And actually, the first nanobody what we developed is CD4, and we are close to bring this into the clinic. Actually, this is one of our major goals that we bring our stuff, what we develop on new tracers and on new machines into the clinic, like the PET MRI, but also over here, like nanobodies or tracers. Another hobby is really, and maybe you heard the talk today from Jonathan Cotton, is tumor senescence. We like to detect tumor senescence, the cellular stress of tumors, and therefore we developed a radio tracer, which is over here shown. It's a known betagal substrate, and betagal is enriched in senescence tumor cells, and Jonathan radio labeled it with fluorine 18 to the FPY gal tracer. This is taken up by cells through the glute transporter, and then the enzyme, the betagal, cleaves the tracer so that the radioactive component stays intercellular in the cell, and actually non-senescent uh, cells, this gets out again of the cell, and we can image with an enriched, uh, enhanced uh, radioactivity those senescent cells. It's very stable in blood, and actually also with this tracer, we did the preclinical and clinical translation, so from radiochemistry, we built up the entire pipeline to in vitro evaluation in cells, to the in vivo evaluation in three different animal models, and then we went into humans and have a phase one study completed, and a phase two study is actually running with this trace, and we see this in uh, patients with um, a pancreas tumor, uh, and we did first somatostatin receptor imaging. You see the tumor over here uh, in the liver and also uh, over here the, the primary tumor. After dotatate therapy, you see that the liver lesion is gone, but not the primary tumor. So we used in our uh, betagal senescence trace and could very clearly see that where there's a high uptake, we have a, a high enrichment of the tracer, we have an increased P61 and P53 expression, while at the low side we have low P16, so therefore a clear indication for senescence, and we can really say now that our tracer indicates senescence tumor cells. However, the detection is quite complicated because there are small clusters of senescent cells. So this is the full evaluation of the tracer, and we are currently writing the last few lines and sentences of the paper, and you see that even also in mouse models, we have a high uh, ratio between uh, senescence and non-senescence tumor. However, it goes out after a while, like after an hour of the tumor, and therefore we develop a new pipeline of senescence trace, and 
Gunderson has developed now approximately 10 to 12 new tracer, and one very interesting is the TFP GUL tracer, which actually has a higher uptake of approximately factor three compared to non-senescent cell cells, and actually it's retained in the senescent cells. So therefore, we are really looking forward to animal studies and autoradiography is very encouraging, and we plan also to go with this trace in the tumor. I said already, this imaging is very complicated. It's cluster within tumors, so we need an advanced image analysis method. And this is, this is my third topic currently, to really use artificial intelligence and machine learning, as we did over here in this paper, to train algorithm with different imaging sequences and imaging data from ADC, T2, T1 uh, MR imaging, as well as dynamic PET imaging. Then in our PET MRI system for combined imaging, and then a train a multi-view learning network to reveal different information and surrogate markers from the tumor. This is a study, and we brought also this algorithm from preclinical, where we trained it in many, many mice, like 100 mice, and brought it then into the clinic in patients on colorectal patients, and we trained it on colorectal mouse models, and then brought it into patient, and it works actually, so we could translate from preclinical to clinical the same algorithm. If you are more interested, we have just published this recently, um, this, this translational work on machine learning and PET MRI data analysis. So the last few slides of my talk would be a little bit my vision, and we put this together with several co-authors in a, in a Nature Review Cancer paper just this year. And I think really we need the different imaging modalities, and everyone knows those overviews that we have uh, from tissue organ bodies to the cell. But however, I think we need really also to go more to the omics uh, field and integrate omics into our imaging workflow. What I think is also important that we consider more the scales of our imaging, so the time scales. And this is especially interesting in PET MRI where we have different time scales where we can do fast imaging, slow imaging, and therefore see in oncology, like in hypoxia, but also in the brain, how the signals shift with the time. Another thing what is important is clearly radiochemistry, radiopharmacy. I guess it's essential. We need it, and therefore radiochemists are the most important uh, people in our lab. So we need the different tracer, and we develop tracer for immunity, for metabolism, for the microenvironment and for tumor stress. A few I showed you, but this is the full range of tracer we are working, and several of them are developed in our group. And with having all this in place, the multimodality imaging, the detector technology, the multimodality imaging devices, the tracers, the protocols, and the advanced image analysis, we can see that in future imaging is really going multimodality, PET, CT, MRI. You detect before you start a therapy all the different parameters, the heterogeneity of a tumor. You analyze it very intensively by, uh, uh, by AI and machine learning method. Then you start your treatment and you do follow-up scan. You might change your treatment based on this. However, in summary, what this slide should show you, we must go deeper. That's always what I like to say. We need to go deep in our data. We need to get all the data we can get. We should not leave it up to the field of genomics, metabolomics, or proteomics. We have so much opportunities with our different imaging uh, uh, compounds and tracers and contrasts. We should definitely do this. So finally, this is the Werner Siemens Imaging Center, and it's not only my work. We have really now 100 people, and very, I'm very proud of this institution. Uh, so therefore, there's like uh, Bettina Weigelin. She works on microscopy and multi-scale imaging. She works on cell, uh, cell uh, communication, on intervital microscopy in living tissue, on whole organ light sheet microscopy, and translate this uh, to the macroscopic era. And actually, Bettina Weigelin has a professorship in our department in leading the group. Christina Herford is working on neuroimaging. She does PET MRI and connectivity and the connectome. She also develops new tracer, like she has a very encouraging compound for alpha synuclein imaging for Parkinson, which will also go into patients in the next three, uh, two or three months. So Christina is heading uh, this uh, part of our lab and has a professorship for neuroimaging. 
Then we have Andre Martins. Uh, he was essential to really build up our strengths and our expertise in MRI and hyperpolarized imaging. He is uh, doing meta metalomics and uh, look for different contrasts beyond of PET and combines these contrasts with uh, PET and MRI. And therefore, Andre has a professorship also in our department on MRI imaging. We do immune imaging and infectious imaging, and this, for example, is led by Nico Bézier, maybe you saw his, his talk on Aspergillus imaging with an Aspergillus-specific antibody, and Nico is leading this research. Our radiochemistry, I mentioned it already, it's really essential for our lab, and Jonathan Cotton, I work with him on the senescence tracer, Andreas Maurer and Gerald Reichel, who translate our compounds into the clinic. Then we have really the luck that we have also physicians in our lab who work in the clinical department and in our lab, and therefore they do like all the immune imaging and take our tracers and bring it into the clinic, which is Manfred Kneiling, Johannes Schwenk, uh, Salvador Castaneda, uh, and Dominic Sonanini. Uh, I still do detector development, and just last week we got a big grant accepted for a combined clinical PET MRI for breast imaging, which has a dedicated breast detector, and Julia Mannheim and Fabian Schmidt is working on this. And our most important person who helps and keeps us under control is Rebecca Rock. I would also like to thank her, and specifically the Werner Siemens Foundation. It's not the Siemens company, it's the Family Foundation, and the IFIT Cluster of Excellence, who funds all of our work and the entire department. However, I could never do it. It's really the team, and that's the team photo from our offsite retreat in Obergurgel this year. You see we go to the high elevation of the mountains in the Austria Alps. It has snow, a lot of snow. We enjoy skiing, we enjoy talking about science, and I'm really happy to have this group, to have you. And again, it's all about the team. It's really not about me. And therefore, this award is really our award. It's the team award. Thank you very much for everything. And last but not least, the Werner Siemens Imaging Center thanks really the World Molecular Imaging Society. You are our society, and we uh, really love to join the meetings over here. We are here with two buses, actually, from Tübingen. It's just a six-hour drive, and therefore we are really dedicated to the WMIC and WMIS. Thank you very much. Thank you all, my friends and colleagues. I'm really honored to get this award. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.